Dango, how are you doing? Can you hear me? Hello, I'm good. Yeah, I hear you. Perfect. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm going to ask you to tell me a little bit about the history of the band. doesn't need to be anything that long. It can be a short version if you want. Uh, we started in 2001. Yeah, we have released five full lengths and a split. Uh, me and also have been in the band all the time, and we have had a number of drummers coming and going. Yeah, and we have been, you know, doing our thing over the years, uh, building slowly and steady, like our fan base. In the past, I don't know how many years, we've been touring, like, or more or less all over the world, in Europe, North America, South America, and Australia. Uh, yeah, and then we got a bit tired, it was too much, so we took a break for now, it's been one and a half year almost since we played last time. Yeah, now we're gonna go back again in August and play our first record from the start. No, from the finish to start, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, I heard in an interview that you guys stayed the first years of the band without earning any money. Also, I saw the Fuzzamentari, the documentary by Truck Fighters. And it says that in the beginning, your requirements to make a gig would be gas money, food, and somewhere to stay. How were the early years of the band, and on what point you guys started to make some money of that? <coughs> oh, I think that's how it is for most bands in the beginning to just, you know, yeah. uh, struggle and uh, invest time and your money as well. And do and do it because you like it, and not because uh, you think that you're gonna be rich from it. I took us, I don't know, I don't remember exactly, but uh, eight, maybe eight, nine years until we started seeing that we got a little bit of money from it, like a bit more than we, it costed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then it took another, I don't know how many years, three, four, five years more before we could make like a decent uh, economic situation in it. Uh, in the very beginning, how would you guys book in your tours? Uh, in the beginning, of course, we were booking ourselves like most bands do before they find people that wants to work with them. Uh, so we sent, I don't know, we sent hundreds of emails and maybe we got, you know, two, two shows booked. <laughs> so. No, it's just uh, hard work, and especially when you are up and coming band, like you don't have already fans that clubs know that there's gonna be people if they book you. It's difficult to to get get there. I mean, to get to the point where where you get more like people ask you to come and play instead of you had to chase the shows. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which part internet was important for that? How much internet it for, was important for that? I know there's a a very growing Stoner Hawk scene on the internet, on YouTube mostly. And which part internet take on that? What do you mean? Uh, this question. In your fan base. How much Can internet take... was important for you guys to get a solid fan base? Uh -huh, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I think uh, it's hard to say. I mean, things were the way they were, so you can't really compare it to something else. But. Uh, when we started the band, the internet wasn't that, you know, that uh, common. It was common, but it wasn't so fast. So then we still, you know, we printed, like, we burned demo CDs and sent around to, to some labels and reviewers and everything like that. But I think that the internet is like the, the means for, for people especially in peop other parts of the world, in Europe, to discover the music. Uh, and nowadays it's, uh, it's a two-sided, you know, coin. Because on one side you barely get any money at all from, from streaming. But on the other hand, everyone can find your music if they want and, and listen to it. Uh, so, which generates other things, of course. And it's very cool, I think, for people these days to, I want to hear a song and then they can just listen to any song in the world. Uh, so obviously, if you manage to somehow get through the noise of the millions of bands that are out there, then it's a great opportunity to, to reach everyone, of course. Do you think it reflected on the amount of people that would come to the show? 
or not much? Uh, well, you know, the first time we went to South America, uh, we had the first show in Buenos Aires in Argentina. And uh, since we didn't sell any records in South America, we had really no ID because uh, we hadn't looked at any real Facebook statistic or anything like that. We didn't know these details then. I think this was like six years ago or something. So that was when we started to become more aware of of like uh, actively working social medias and these things. And because if we go if we go somewhere today, then we would go to Facebook and see like aha, we have. 2000 likes in this country or so we at least have something to expect, but then we had no idea and we I think we had like 600 people coming to the show in Buenos Aires. So we were very Very impressed by the turnout because we had no idea what to expect. Yeah, but but nowadays I, I think you can You can see I mean you can see Facebook stats and you can see how many people likes from a specific country, but uh, I think that the young people today don't use Facebook so much because that's like you and me, our age, might use it. <laughs> yeah, kind of so it's hard. Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> you know, but you know, but the kids of today, I think they they think that Facebook is for for the, an older generation mostly. Uh, so it's hard. You, you can use different different channels on different ways and see. I mean, nowadays you can also check Facebook statistics. Uh, I mean, Spotify, for example. Uh, and there you can also see countries and uh, and cities. So it gives you like a hint, of course, if you are popular somewhere, but it's not 100% reliable. Yeah, definitely. Okay, I gotta, I gotta skip to the next subject now. Um, how you guys deal with personal life during those years? Uh, the way you guys tour, you are always on tour, always traveling to make gigs. How you guys deal with your personal life during all this period? Yeah, it's a it's a big puzzle to to get this lifestyle to work out. Well, it's different. I mean, when we were younger and and didn't make money on it, but then it was less other things to take care of at least in the life um, because we were a bit younger. And now we have more things to take care of, but we make money from the music, so it kind of evens out. Or I guess in the end. But it's a, it's a big puzzle to make everything, you know, to satisfy your own needs and wishes and and your, your girlfriend and we had kids and, uh, you know, it's a, yeah, it's a big struggle. It's hard to to make everything work out. Can you Support guys families. keep regular jobs while you are in a band or you're making all your money with music? And nowadays we, we only have the music because me and also we also own uh, the Fasorama record label. So we, we work with that as well. Okay. Uh, but now for many years we had to work as well, but it's obviously you cannot have a normal job and then tour the way that we did. So we had to, you know, I was lucky enough to do some kind of freelancing because I went, I'm a sound engineer by, you know, uh, studied to and, and worked. I worked with that for like 10 years. So then I could say I can work there and there and there I cannot work. And also he has, you know, different jobs here and there. But it's not like you can have a serious job and make a career and then also try to make a career on the music. I don't, that's very seldom that that was going to work in the long run, obviously. Yeah, makes sense. And which point you guys uh, realized that you had to create your own record label, Fuzorama? Uh, I don't know if we felt like we had to, but we, we wanted to. Yes. Uh, because we had the, we had recorded two like demo EPs, 2001 and 2002, and then we were like, when we're gonna when we were gonna record the next thing, we're like, ah, we're a bit tired of sending around these demo CDs to labels. So maybe we should just it would be fun to start a label. <laughs> and we had no idea how to do it or or you know anything, but we did it anyway. So, so the the main idea was that we wanted to release like a real track like this record instead of a demo. Uh, but we also said it would be fun to sign other bands and do it, you know, do it a bit for real, and not just like a band that releases their own stuff on their own label. Uh, I want to know a bit how Fuzzer Oma works on basically three states. 
the predicting stage, the stage of booking, and the stage of promoting? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> yeah, take one at a time. What was the first? Regarding the predicting bands. Uh, yeah, uh, we have a studio, but it's not like we we usually don't record ourselves the bands. That normally the bands uh, come with a master that's ready that oh, we work okay. with. Uh, but some bands have been in our studio, and some bands we have also like uh, produced ourselves. But it's been a while now. Okay. Actually. Next one is the booking stage. You're booking ourselves, but you guys booking another bands as a record label. Um, the booking part is like um, more like pulling threads here and there. I mean, where we we have so many, we have so many people that we meet when we tour with track fighters, and we have got to know a lot of people. So, so we work uh, more like offering the bands on the label to the festivals and uh, and doing what we can do. But we don't, we usually don't exclusively like book the bands okay. because uh, we don't have time to to work enough for it being the only booker for a band, then it would be, we would have to do more of that and less of something else. Okay. Uh, the last one is the stage of promoting, promoting albums, selling them, promoting material. Yeah, well, releasing a record is, uh, it's a bit tricky because in one way you can do, you can work, I mean, you can work until you die with it and do, do everything that you can think of. And on the other hand, at some point, you have to just say that, okay, now I'm going to focus on the next project. But we normally try to work with some, at least in some territories, like external promotion companies. And then we have a big uh, mailing list ourselves. And then we also, of course, we put some ads sometimes and we promote on the social medias, try to get the bands booking agents and on the road. That's, that's the best promotion that bands are playing live, I would say. Yeah. Definitely. All right, uh, I got a question about your guitar now. You have a very original guitar, uh, Gibson, a blue one with a white stripe in the middle. How did you get that guitar? Uh, I looked in the catalog and I thought, this one looks cool, I will take it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I used to play a really old Rickenbacker guitar the first six or seven years. Uh, but it's, I got a bit afraid to, to tour with it, and I was like that I would ruin it, and I couldn't find another one the same. And it's also nice to have two exactly the same guitars when you so you have a backup guitar that feels the same as your first guitar. No, so so we got a good deal with Gibson uh, at that year, and then they just said like, look in the catalog and tell us what we should order, more or less. So we bought them. Well, I mean, we had still had to pay for it, but not much in that way. So it was a good timing. So then, yeah, I got one, and then I heard that that model was like a limited edition. So then, when I heard that, I instantly called the distributor here in Sweden. It's like, do you have another one? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and since then, I try. I've been buying them when I'm when I've seen them somewhere. It's really seldom that they show up. So. Yeah, great. Uh, in the beginning of the interview, I said that you guys are planning something from August this year or next year. I don't remember. Uh, I know you guys have been in the Yaddles for one year and a half. Uh, what are the plans for the bands for the future? We're going to do now uh, a Gravity X tour. Uh, and I don't know how long it's going to take because we want to cover all the parts of the world where we have been touring before at least. So everyone can get a chance to see this show. Uh, and after that we haven't decided what we're going to do. We don't want to be so... A new drummer? We don't have a fixed drummer these days. We play with with a drummer, okay. obviously. But I don't think it's going to take a lot if we're going to call a drummer like a member again. But hopefully it's going to happen. But we have been, we learned from the past. <laughs> <laughs> it's not so easy. No. Uh, okay. no so so that's, that's the idea. I mean, to, to do the Gravity X around the world and try to play a bit less frequent. And in the past, we don't run out of fuel again. I guess coming to Brazil again? Hopefully, but we haven't anything like concrete planned. I hope so. All right, Dango, thank you very much for your time. That was no a, problem. A, a giant pleasure to have you here. Uh, thank you very much for being here.
Oh, thank you. Have a good day. Bye bye.